Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Better Managers Briefing. I'm Anne Franca, the Chief Executive of CMI, and each time on this Friday, we bring you uh, news on the latest management topics. Now, today, I'm delighted to uh, welcome as my guest uh, the CMI companion, Bob uh, Wigley, who has um, written a fabulous and really interesting book called Born Digital, the story of a distracted generation. And he's also the chair of UK Finance and has served on a number of government committees. Welcome, Bob. Thank you for having me. Really excited to be with you. Well, now I have um, read uh, Born Digital. Thank you for sharing that with me. And it is a fascinating book. And I just wondered, you know, you've been in business, finance, um, um, a prolific supporter of free markets, and yet you've written a book about the some of the negative impacts of technology and called for tighter regu uh, regulation. So tell us, how did you come up with this thesis and um, why do you want to regulate technology? Uh, two things really. One, about two years ago, I, I made a New Year's resolution to try and meet a Generation Z entrepreneur every business day for two years. So when I did that, I've now met about 200 and uh, it was always, by the way, the best hour of every day. I was bowled over by their insights, their enthusiasm, their passion, uh, their social conscience, their sense of purpose. Um, but it gave me uh, some ideas about how that generation is living its life and through technology and seeing the world very differently from the way my generation uh, does. Um, and that there were very common themes. And I wanted to try and kind of put that down. And in the process of doing that, I realized that we were in danger of repeating the mistakes of history, uh, whether it be sleepwalking into the uh, the dot-com boom and bust, the financial crisis, the climate crisis, and now not preparing for a pandemic. And so I'm calling out what I think is a, is a, is a distraction crisis that we're all facing caused by technology. Um, and that's really what the book is about. Okay. And um, where does the regulation of technology companies come into that? So uh, where to start? So the central issue which I'm looking at in the book is uh, we know that from, from the surveys of youngsters that they themselves are uh, unhappier than they have been for a decade. And we're seeing rising rates of uh, anxiety, depression, sadly, self-harm and even suicide. And those rates have broadly doubled over a 10 year period during which time technology has become ubiquitous in our lives. Now, when you examine the academic evidence, it's mixed and there's definitely no causal link between the two. But I don't believe it's a coincidence. Um, and one of the things I call for in the book actually is more cooperation between big tech platforms and civic society and academia to really get to the bottom of what is good and bad about the inter interaction with the Internet and what may be causing some of these things so that we can tackle the harms um, at source. Yes. And um, do you think that this... Uh rising screen time, um, use of gaining, uh, and, and declining well-being among adolescents is, is, is proven? And how do you think COVID has impacted this? Well, it's, it's definitely, if we put addictive gaming on one side as a category in itself, I'll come back to that. The, the general issue of whether rising screen time and social media use is linked to rising rates of anxiety, uh, depression, and worse is definitely not proven. Um, as I said, there's evidence in both directions. Um, if you talk about gaming specifically, there is a, a form of you know compulsive use of gaming, which becomes an addiction, which is very definitely a problem. Um, but I think uh, there is enough evidence to believe that there, there are issues that need further examination. And that's probably what's behind the UK government's attempt to introduce the online harms bill this year. So this is really groundbreaking uh, legislation being brought in by the UK government ahead of anything else that anybody in the world has really done. And it will, for the first time, impose a statutory duty of care on big tech platforms um, to look at whether their products and services might be causing harms, particularly to youngsters. And if they are, to take actions to mitigate those harms. Uh, and Ofcom will have the job of assessing whether the mitigations are sufficient. And if they're not, potentially fining platforms if they don't believe sufficient action is uh, is taking place. That's a big step. And it's, I think, to the credit of the government, they're bringing that in as, a, as part of a suite of regulation. That's one. The second is the age-appropriate design code. 
So this is a separate piece of uh, legislation and regulation that will require big techs to um, assess the type of content that may be available to youngsters through their platforms um, and will require them to um, potentially to age assure, meaning they'll need to know the age of the person using their platform and then uh, moderate the content appropriately. This is, this is also a big step. The third is in the uh, education arena to bring in uh, res uh, to bring in relationship education for the first time. So this will be part of the core curriculum, and it will have a module in it um, which will explain the difference between on and offline relationships and discuss some of the dangers of online relationships. That doesn't go as far as I would like to see, which is which is to move completely to uh, as part of the core curriculum having a module on uh, responsible internet use. But it's a, it's a step in the right direction. Then finally. Um, within the Competition Markets Authority, we have a new digital markets unit, which will look at the antitrust issues around some of the uh, dominant and, and uh, big platforms with very substantial market shares and whether, whether and how uh, regulation can help deal with those monopolistic issues. So there's a big, big push in the UK to try and make the UK the safest and most transparent place to be online in the world. Yeah, and you know some of these um, statistics that you share are quite um, staggering, and it is—it's always um, uh, uh, fascinated me how these tech companies can amass these hugely large market shares um, and yet not have have any regulation. Now, the other thing you've mentioned is that you feel that uh, all of the online world—and you've you've mentioned this on this interview—is damaging the emotional intelligence of young people. Um, and hence then the need for this relationship module, right? What is the difference between online and offline relationships? Um, tell me a little bit more about that because I found that quite fascinating. So it would be ridiculous, I think, to assume that all of these issues around anxiety, depression, loneliness, unhappiness, and, and just, just to bring out a couple of stats, 15-year-olds um, in the UK are, according to them, uh, this is through the the Children's Society annual survey are the least happy in Europe, and they are the least happy they've been for 25 years, including um, within friendship. So this is not a kind of trivial issue. It's a big issue. Um, sorry, I've forgotten your original question. I went off on a tangent. What was your original question? Oh, EQ. About, yes, an emotional yeah, question. Yeah. yeah. So, so I talk in the book a lot about the way that technology, without doing it intentionally, attacks the places where empathy would have developed in your generation and my generation. So... Mm -hmm. Um, we are prone to face-to-face -to -face conversation. Youngsters tend to message, not talk. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're conversing with someone and um, uh, you start talking and you see them wince, you change tack because you realize you're saying that they something that they find offensive or difficult or they disagree with. If you're messaging, not talking through, through text, uh, you don't get that response. You don't get those visual clues. And so um, whether it be uh, basic conversation, whether it be in the workplace, where we've now moved to, you know, very often hot desking. And I talk in the book about the concept, I'll come back to it later, but the concept of office pilots you know, wearing our earbuds and engaging in three devices and possibly the two human beings you don't talk to are the ones you're sitting next to. Whether it be the decline of communal eating uh, um, because the family unit is changing and we're eating less together. Youngsters prefer food on the go, you know, to, to grab and go food. Um, all of these places where we would have established empathy are sort of undermined by technology. And I do think that is a, an issue because it's empathy ultimately which binds society together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, without sort of exaggerating, it stops us from killing each other. And, and, I, and I think we have a more polarized society than ever. That's what the surveys tell us. So I do think we should be concerned about it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do agree with you. Um, now, you also talk at length in your book about how all of this is affecting workplaces. And you have this chapter called Fidgetal Workplaces, which I found quite fascinating. Um, so tell us, what does that mean? And how uh, will workplaces need to change to attract Gen Z and to evolve? Well, Fidgetal literally means the combination of physical and digital. Now, because you and I started in a world where we didn't have a smartphone, we differentiate between the on and offline world. Generation Z has never known a time when there wasn't Google, uh, when they couldn't use a smartphone, when they didn't, as I put it, have a supercomputer and a world-class film studio in their pocket. And for the younger elements of uh, Generation Z, um, they didn't even need to type. They can simply talk at a machine and it will tell them the answer. Okay, 
So that's fundamentally different. They therefore don't see that boundary between the on and offline world. And I think that will carry over into the work environment. I don't think they will see a physical boundary between the workplace uh, and working at home. Now, that could be a good thing because actually I think, and COVID has potentially shown us this, that productivity actually can go up yeah. when people are working from home. Uh, they can be very efficient. They're actually spending more time working because they're not traveling. Um, and technology comes in, into its own to allow uh, remote working. But youngsters, I think, will will require um, high degrees of sophistication from employers in terms of their attitude to technology. And they will judge that from the very moment they apply to work from you. So how do you recruit? I hear stories week in, week out from the youngsters I meet. Oh, it's just terrible. that The processes they go through to get an internship where they have to go online and fill in forms. It's the same information in slightly different forms for every employer. It takes hours. Then they don't get an acknowledgement. Then they get a rejection. You know, we should be doing this by video. Mm -hmm. And this is what the youngsters want. If the forward looking firms, McDonald's now use Snapchat for uh, to recruit its servers. And they have something called Snapplications, <laughs> uh, which just sums up exactly how it works. Um, Goldman Sachs, I believe, is using TikTok to rec recruit some graduates. So some of the forward looking firms are realizing that it's this kind of interaction, which when you think about it, when you read a CV, you don't really get a picture of a person. And you certainly no. don't get any idea of their personality. If you have a three minute conversation with someone on a video, you very much understand their personality. So so whether it be how you apply to a firm and how you are on board it, uh, whether it be your training, whether it be your appraisal, you know, the days of the enormous uh, employee survey are out of the window. Long emails are out of the window. What we need is snappy, punchy videos that are hyper personalized to the recipient that they can respond to quickly. They can snack and graze and respond. That leads into the next area for digital workplaces, which is I think youngsters now are looking for what I call experiences, not jobs. Mm -hmm. So we might have wanted to go and work for a big profitable company with a huge brand name and stay there five years and progress through various stages. Youngsters want to come, take, learn and move on. Um, right. uh, Reid Hoffman actually described working at LinkedIn as a tour of duty. He said it's rotational, it's to learn, it's transformational to one, one's long term career and in the process we hope to the company as well. They're also looking for benefits, not salaries. This isn't just about being somewhere for five years and getting paid more each year. You know, do we have a cool working environment? Is it in a cool location? Can I remote work? Can I flexi time? Can I have paid time off? Can I have access to my pay at any time during the month? So everyday access to pay schemes. Um, have I got health care? These are the things that are important to youngsters. So it will require us to completely rethink the way we employ people, uh, train them, appraise them, and motivate them. We'll need to think about shorter term roles, project working, customization, the degree of hyper personalization they're used to on the web in the way they're marketed to is exactly how we're going to have to think about it from uh, an employee point, point of view. And the final thing I think to mention is that, you know, I think there is a misunderstanding about the gig economy or the sharing economy. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a school of thought that this is just a way that employers take advantage of employees by putting them on zero as contracts. I look at it rather differently, having having listened to a lot of youngsters. They actually don't necessarily want to do one thing. Think of it as an extension of when they're watching Netflix and they're messaging and they're on Snapchat and maybe have an earbud in listening to some music all at the same time. They want to be at work and they want jobs, but they don't necessarily want to do a full time job and nothing else. They want to they want to multitask. They want to side hustle. They want to be over here starting a social a social enterprise. So we're going to need to think about how we develop the sharing economy to accommodate what youngsters want to do if we want to retrain, uh, so to, sorry, to attract, retain and uh, develop uh, the best talent. And that finally leads you to the workplace itself. Mm -hmm. um, well, two other things, actually, I'll touch on. I think one, the workplace, and secondly, what I call purposes, not businesses. So the workplace itself needs to take account of the things that youngsters find important apart from being cool, you know, they really value the, the real environment and they're worried about the planet. So making our workspaces more biophilic, uh, which is the technical term for bringing greenery into the office, not, not just the yucca plant in the corner, which is what we've been doing for a long time, but literally making the, the workplace feel like it's connected to the planet. Um, and, and a lot of new, uh, modern architects are really thinking this through. Using an AR and VR, you know, ideation tools in our, in our development of creativity um, the idea of actually of silent rooms where we can go and be away from technology. Um, and here's a really big one. So technology teaches youngsters to multitask, as I've said. 
Mm-hmm. The problem with that is, does it remove, because of the neuroplasticity of the brain, the ability to do anything deep? Can we actually have a deep conversation anymore without constantly being distracted by our phone or incoming messages? Can we deep watch a film? Can we deep read a book? Now, if we can't do those things anymore, and that's all happening at a time when AI is developing, robots are arriving to take away lower level work. Are we training our youngsters to be able to do the kind of deep work, which is the only work that may be left when the robots have taken away um, more basic work um, uh, that it can? So that's a that's a big one. That's a very big question. Um, actually, all well, of just these on, on purposes, not businesses. I think this is yeah, right in, sure. in CMI land. So so one of the things that came through very strongly from the 200 uh, entrepreneurs I met, they don't want to work for a business. They don't want to work for a big profitable company with a big brand name uh, that just makes lots of money. The business better be about something more important than making money. Mm-hmm. It needs a purpose. And we know in the financial services industry where I'm you know, working deeply that we're trying to redefine our purpose. We need to start talking about helping families buy their first home, helping families buy a car, helping a business and buy its new premises and expand its facilities using language that means something in the context of everyday life, um, but but sult- ultimately serving society and some wider purpose. Most youngsters want to work for a business that does something more than make profit. We call it, I call it purposes, not businesses, but that is a huge one. It's very, very important and, and leaders that um, have been at the forefront of that um, Unilever Sustainable Living Plan comes to mind. Um, you know, did see their attractiveness with young people increase as a result of that. And I know in your book, you give the example of somebody that started the hand washing program, you know, a simple bar of soap reinvented as preventing childhood disease, saving children's lives in um, in, in, in the developing world. And um, I think that is a very important trend. Um, by the way, you, you can ask Uh, Bob questions. If you have a question, please do put it in the chat and we'll get to as many of your questions as we can later on in the broadcast. Um, But you mentioned the value system. So purposes, not not businesses, Um, multitask, experience, not jobs. Um, So what does this mean for CEOs of FTSE 350 companies? I mean, how do they need to change to attract and retain and ultimately motivate this generation? So I think there are a whole range of issues. I've talked about uh, issues in terms of employment, uh, recruitment, training, uh, promotional career paths. But underneath all that, I think there's a pretty well developed now what I call Generation Z value system. It's the new value system that's driving these youngsters. And let me run through a few of its, mm-hmm. its aspects. One of the big ones is based on this sort of multitasking, grazing, what I call digital bees uh, kind of theme is one of minimal commitment so they won't necessarily want to stay with you as long as you 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 might have expected um and um when it comes to buying your products and services they probably only want them for as long as they need them so we've moved to rent not buy you know in terms mm-hmm. of our primary mode of, of engagement with products and services and that's that's a huge one. so that's why you know things like uber and airbnb and these other mm-hmm. businesses that are based on a sharing the sharing economy um, is, is what youngsters want. The, uh, the second aspect of that, and Airbnb, you know, is big on this, is it's about experiences, not ownership. So they want to experience the benefits of the asset, but not actually have the have the limitations that come with owning it. Um, but the experience is highly valued. So putting uh, putting flesh on the bone around the experience. So it's not just renting a flat. When you get there, there's a concierge service that gives you everything you need. Um, the CEO of Airbnb, as I said, gone big on the whole concept of, of experiences, not ownership. The next thing is hyper-personalization. So just as technology serves you up precisely the product you want to buy just at the moment you want to buy it, we could talk about su- the surveillance economy and how we get there using algorithms and and your attention and data. But so uh, so employees, uh, sorry, 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 so um, companies will need to think about how to hyper-person their products. Think about Nike, the Nike ID program or Calvin Klein, or if you're buying underwear now, you literally choose the banding, the seams. It's all, it's personalized to you specifically. Lacoste the same with their shirts. You pick the cuff, the brow, uh, and the, and the logo. You decide where to put it, what color it is. It's hyper personalized. So we'll need to be doing that with a lot more products and services. Um, sustainability has to be at the core of your purpose. So this is one of the things, so sustainability and inclusivity, actually, I think are two overarching themes the youngsters really care about 
you know, if you're not in promoting a fashionable, a fashionable clothing item, having some responsibility for the planet in the same breath, you better watch out because your product is probably dead. And that goes through, I think, pretty much every business. Um, peer to peer feedback. You know, we're, they're not interested in long adverts on, on, on traditional media sources. They want snappy recommendations in short sort of meme like videos from their friends, from celebrities, from influencers. So the micro influencer is here to stay. And that's where the ad spending will be going. Um, yeah, that, I think those are some fascinating trends. And I'm not sure how well understood that is. I mean, um, it did strike me earlier that when the government put a travel ban, it's OK to travel for work. But if you're an influencer and your work is going to Dubai on a beach, that's not OK. But that is their work. Right. So that to me kind of represented with that we have a lot of catching up to do to understand this um, new new generation. Um, but you did touch on uh, before we go to questions um, that you felt that the UK had the potential to be um, leading in the area of big tech regulation. Um, um, globally, do you think that's true? Who's who? You know, who who would you like to see do more if the UK is doing a lot? So the UK is definitely out there having a good go at it. Uh, Australia, I think, has has been impressive. They employed a full time government e-safety commissioner whose job is to both advise the public on how to use the internet safely and to advise the government on things they need to be tackling. Um, and you've seen uh, the government in Australia recently take Facebook to task yeah. trying to get them to pay for um, for news content that they take from other news sources and distribute. Um, the EU has some similar ideas around data. They want to force the big tech companies to share the data they have with medium and smaller sized companies so that it can benefit a much wider range of market participants. And that, that no doubt will be a subject of hot debate over the next 12 months. Um, mm. America, I think, is starting to, to move. So Biden's arrival has got to be very good news. Just mm -hmm. before the presidential election, uh, the attorney general sent a clause to Congress, which would have the effect of repealing or, or, or substantially diminishing Section 230. That's the the piece of US legislation that gives the big tech platforms a shield against being responsible for the content on their platforms, which is posted by users. In other mm -hmm. words, the thing that makes them a platform operator, not a publisher. Yeah. And if that goes through, that's that is striking at the heart of the big tech models. And that's huge. The second big thing that's going on in the States is the DOJ pursuing some of the biggest platforms at the moment in antitrust lawsuits following a fabulous report that came out again just before Christmas from the Senate Committee on the Judiciary, the Antitrust Subcommittee, which basically concluded that the American antitrust regime had failed the American people over the last 10 years and, mm -hmm. and some actions needed to be taken to, uh, to deal with the now either dominant or very um, substantially uh, with massive market share platform. So there's lots going on. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I think people, as you, as you say in the book, are waking up, right? So, uh, and it is indeed time to wake up. Well, it's a fascinating book. I highly recommend it, Born Digital, um, the story of a distracted generation. But let's let's take some questions. We've got the first one from Mina. Bob, the book sounds fascinating. So much has been said about generational differences, but I like you feel, I like you feel Gen Z have many traits that make them well prepared for professional life, e.g. sense of purpose. So do you think that this distraction factor is the real issue about how we integrate Gen Z into professional life? It's a re really good question. So I think a couple of comments on that. The first is um, uh, LinkedIn, actually, in, in addition to talking about this concept of the tour of duty, do pick up on my theme in the book about how technology systematically attacks the places where empathy developed in our in our lifetime. And they say, they note that staff are now arriving with lower emotional quotients than uh, the previous generation. So one thing you're going to have to think about as an employer is how you help Generation Z develop uh, the emotional qu quotient that will enable them to survive and prosper in a, in a professional working environment. I think that's one big deal. Um, I think the other thing you're going to need to think about is, is as I said, how you communicate with them. So the days of the the days of the long, you know, email uh, with 14 paragraphs, forget it. You've got to be using snappy uh, video based communication, short messages, pithy uh, and expect feedback in the same form. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, the, the other thing, the other thing is, I think you, you, you're going to have to expect that Generation Z wants to be heard. It doesn't want to just turn up and do what it's told. 
Um, I liken this a bit to, you know, when, when businesses become purposes, not businesses, they sort of become a bit like third, third sector companies where, so I've worked in several, well, you know, deputy chairman of business community for a while. I, I chair a trade organization. We're not a commercial organization. We're some way between a charity and a business. Mm -hmm. And what that means is people turn up with, uh, with thoughts and attitude. They're not there to just work for money. They want their opinion to be heard. They want to be taken into account. And that's exactly what Generation Z is like. They have opinion and they expect to be heard. Yes, absolutely. And we define CMI as a social enterprise. And we I see exactly what you're talking about. But we've we've got another question from Anita. Thanks for covering this hot topic, CMI. I would like to ask Bob, would he extend or change any of his conclusions in light of COVID-19? After homeschooling fatigue, my 15-year-old daughter can't wait to dispense with her screen and have contact with peers in person. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, I had to change some of what I was saying in the book because of uh, COVID-19, and I was seeing it myself in our own family life. It did cause us to recalibrate, for example, in the context of my 16-year-old son, the value of gaming, where at least he was in part communicating with his friends um, whilst playing the game, and he couldn't go and see them. And, he made that point very strongly to me when I was telling him to get off the screen for the third time on a particular day. Uh, he said, I can't go and see my friends. At least I can talk to them this way. Um, so I think it did lead us to, to, to recalibrate, but I think it frankly is a temporary recalibration. And whilst I'm, I'm delighted that your daughter is keen to get out and meet her friends and my God, aren't we all? Um, I think that she will quickly go back to integrating her screens into her everyday interactions with her friends. I don't think she's going to be just seeing her friends. And I think we have to stick with the long term issue, which was very prevalent pre COVID. And I, I fear whatever the new normal looks like will be pretty prevalent in that environment, too. So, yes, I did. I did recalibrate in writing the book and, and I, I've rewritten some paragraphs. But ultimately, I don't think it changes the main issue. Yeah, no, it's a fair point. So a question from Adam. You mentioned the distraction factor and the expectations of experiences rather than jobs. Do you see traditional line management approaches being a ticking time bomb here as so many will need to rethink their approach? Well, listen, I think it's exactly like every other area of management. You have the forward looking companies that think about these things and then adopt new approaches, maybe trial new approaches, adopt them, see what works, see what appeals. Uh, and ultimately they will, they will succeed and others will fail. And I think uh, the slower organizations will then observe what others are doing and have to catch up. So, uh, yes, I do. I do think a lot of employers will have to change the way they think about uh, attracting talent, retaining talent, motivating talent, appraising talent, paying talent. Mm -hmm. It's going to change fundamentally. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, as always, let's look at let's look at the beacons who are, who are ahead of everybody else. And probably, you know, some of the rest of us will end up copying some of the better things they've done. Absolutely. And, you know, the tolerance, employee voice is growing and the tolerance for command and control behavior is diminishing. And we've seen that when leaders speak to their employees in a way that the employees don't like. It leaks online and the leaders end up resigning. Right. So you see that happening already. Um, so we have another question from Asha. Do you think that EQ could actually be enhanced by some of the ways in which remote working has helped people in the workplace connect better? as people are seeing each other in different environments, and set, et cetera, so. Um, the short answer to that, Ash, is I'm afraid I don't see that. I, mm -hmm. I, I think that the overall effect of COVID has been to increase isolation, not to not to decrease it, and, uh, and um, I don't think that's a good thing. Um, and um, uh, I don't think, you know, screen conversation is as good as face-to-face -face conversation, not least um, because you're very often actually not looking at the person you're talking to because you're looking at the camera or the camera is not located where it would be to get a to get your your eye movements and your facial reactions. So uh, and, and, and often kids anyway, when they are talking on FaceTime, they're, they're multitasking because they're doing other things at the same time. So I, I don't think there's any substitute for face to face uh, time. And I do worry about how companies will innovate and create uh, and and, it, and um, facilitate creativity if people can't get back to at least part time being physically in an office together. I think there is a there is. I mean, of course, uh, the consulting companies and the forward looking companies will be starting to think, how do we create an ideation tool for innovation that that deals with our new environment? But right now, I think it is, it's, it's an issue. Yeah, it's a, it's a very fair point. Um, so uh, Jake has a question. 
Do you believe the use of the large social media sites are the direct cause for the struggles that people are facing today across the board and not just the younger generation? So does this impact everybody, not just Gen Z? Uh, totally. Of course it does. Um, I mean, I focused in the book on, on Gen Z because it was Gen Z entrepreneurs I was meeting on a daily basis. Um, and um, but of course, it affects all of us. And I mean, look, speaking for myself, by the way, I don't hold myself out in any way whatsoever as being a successful parent. I think I was a terrible role model for my kids. I work way too hard. I'm constantly less so now, but I was constantly on my email as they were growing up, uh, you know, on the Blackberry at home. So I'm I'm a terrible role model. Maybe maybe another reason I wrote the book. Um, so yeah, of course it affects all all the generations. It's just that for us, at least, we still have some basic idea of the difference between on and offline. Whereas for these youngsters, there is no, there isn't. It's just all blurred. It's one place. Yeah. Hence your proposal for that course. So we're going to take one last question from Vivian. Do you think a work and learn parallel lifestyle will be a potential norm for the future generations in the digitized world, which ensures people's skill set is updated continuously as part of their working life? I do. And I think that'll happen whether employers make it happen um, or not, because I think um, and maybe I'm, I'm, I was dealing with a bias sample. OK, so, I mean, obviously, the kids I was meeting tended to be in London. They tended to be at some of the better academic institutions, just the way LinkedIn works, um, which is how they contacted me. But but the strong sense I got from them was one of a constant wish to move on to learning about the next thing, mm -hmm. you know, a real hunger for information and knowledge. Um, actually, um, I'll end on this. You know, I think as a generation, we're leaving our kids a pretty miserable hand of cards, whether it's the overhang of the financial crisis, it's the continuing global war on terror, it's a damaged planet. Mm -hmm. And now, just, just in case that wasn't enough, we've given them COVID debt to deal with for their lifetime. You know, we need to help these kids uh, develop as, as well as they possibly can in the circumstances we're leaving with them, which is why I'm so passionate about uh, attacking some of these issues around technology. But be assured, they are incredibly resilient. They are very positive. They're very ambitious. They're very enthusiastic. They have a massive social conscience and purpose. And I am excited about what they will do to improve our world. Good. Well, on that optimistic note, Bob, thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please consider joining the CMI. There's more information in the chat. And remember, Bob's book is called Born Digital, The Story of a Distracted Generation. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me.